Okay, just so y'all know, this is coffee in here. It's really hot, and it's meant to try to help my voice not crack on the songs that we're singing this morning. <laughs> uh, early on, uh, during the first part, I was doing the high part, and uh, it was doing some cracking. So hopefully I also have a voice to go through the message. So I'm looking for help, Lord. <laughs> Did anybody know that there's an election going on? Huh? Yeah, in a, about 60, what is it, 63 days, something like that. There's, there's a little election going to be taking place. Some people have a little bit of interest in it. Uh, I would recommend that if you're an American, vote. And if you haven't registered to vote, to do that. Uh, Teresa actually has forms here with her, and if uh, anyone is not registered, <laughs> you can actually register here. Um, I've seen people out along the highways as well, registering people, and I would just encourage you, don't complain about anything if you don't vote. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Okay? <laughs> just, just don't. And, and, no, and no matter what side of the coin you're on, uh, and, and you all have to determine the right side, but whatever side you're on, don't complain. Be a part of it. Get involved. Amen. Could I challenge you to do something else? 63 days. So that means it's a couple months, right? Till the election. Well, as a part of this message, I'm going to be asking you to give thanks. But why don't you also, every day, from now even through the election, because we're told to do it, would you pray for our leaders? Amen. And would you pray about this election? Because God cares and is involved. Amen. There's so much happening around us that's really, frankly, quite troubling. Let's face it, the fear of COVID-19 is still strong and, and growing even in some ways. People continue to protest and riot, and people are already dying in the process. Police officers are being injured, buildings are being destroyed, people's livelihood is being taken away from them. But I probably don't need to tell you that because you're all probably watching it in the news every day, maybe seeing too much of it. Yet even the worship of God is restricted. I'm thankful that, that businesses are getting to open up a little bit more in various places in the state of California, uh, yet I'm really troubled that I didn't hear the governor say anything about churches. And maybe I was just not listening well enough. Do you get afraid of what's happening around us right now? Do you get afraid? I did one the other day. I went to the store and I realized I have not taken a mask. Oh no, what am I going to do now? I don't have a mask. You know, and I started getting all upset because I can't go in there. What if people are going to do something? And, you, and are you? Troubled and afraid? Do you fear the possibility that the Antichrist is beginning to rule? And we may be in the end times? And here's the fact in this. In the psalm that I read to you already is the focus for our message this morning. Psalm 118. We're going to see that God is with us. Yes, back up. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Psalm 34, verse 4, has been a key verse for this whole series, I will not be afraid. There is a place that we need to fear God. That's a different thing, though, isn't it? But Psalm 34 says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 118, God is going to show us some ways that he will deliver us from our fears. 
So the psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. This psalm is, as I mentioned earlier, one of those most important psalms for, for Israel. Israel sings this psalm at the end of the Passover meal. It's a part of these five different psalms, 115, 16, 17, and 18, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, that all psalms that are sung to the great Hallel. What's Hallel mean? Hallelujah. What's Hallelujah mean? Praise the Lord. These are the, the great psalms as, as the children of Israel are saying, we're doing the Passover meal. God freed us. God saved us. God rescued us. God took care of us. He got us across the Red Sea on dry ground. He took care of Pharaoh's army. He got us out of bondage in Egypt. He carried us to the promised land. On that journey to the promised land, he gave us food to eat and water to drink. He protected us all along the way. In fact, we came to the Jordan River and we got to cross again on dry ground. All because God led us. We came to Jericho and, and what happened? But the walls fell down because God was leading us. And Israel is celebrating with the Passover. They're finally, they're celebrating the fact that God has been taking care of us. God is with us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I might get a little Pentecost on you sometimes this morning. But there's value in that, okay? There's value in us getting excited about that, that God is with us. Why should we be afraid of what people can do to us? And that's what the psalmist is going to ask us. Do you remember when Israel went into bondage? They went into bondage again and, and were exiled. Why? Israel and, and Judah. They got sent off into, into, and, and imprisoned. Why? Because they had rejected God. They turned against him. Israel first is destroyed. Then Judah, 150 years later, is destroyed. And the temple is taken down. And the city walls are destroyed. And the people are in turmoil. And all the leaders get taken away. You might remember a man named Daniel was a part of that. We'll come to him later. And, and Ezra says, then in Ezra chapter 3, verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, when is this? When those who had been taken off came back, when the exiles returned, allowed to and actually told to do this by the king. When they, it, it says, verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols. By the way, can I just make a point? These symbols are sitting up here because we need somebody to play them. Okay. <laughs> Psalm 150 says we're supposed to praise him how? With the timbrel, okay? The Psalms tell us we're supposed to praise him with cymbal and loud crashing cymbal and, and with dance even. We, we got to get excited some, and that's how we need a little bit more rhythm, right, Virgie? Right. So, so you be praying for a drummer. You be praying for somebody to get up there or learn to be it if you've got the ability to count. And he says with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. Can you imagine this day? They're rebuilding the temple. Some of them were sad. I understand that because a few of them remembered what the old temple was like. And it was so much more glorious than this new one. This new foundation is even smaller. But for the rest of them, they may have been born in exile. They're coming back. They're coming to the Holy Land, to the Israel, to the place where they, they had been sent by God, to the promised land. And the temple's being rebuilt. And they're going to celebrate. So with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord. Calm down, Bill. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It wasn't a time to be quiet, folks. And this psalm, this psalm is one of those that also gets sung as the children of Israel are coming into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. How do we know that? Because we have it recorded that they were even singing this psalm as Jesus was riding on a donkey down into Jerusalem for that last Palm Sunday experience. And they celebrate this one thing. And Jesus himself sings his love 
endures. So what can man do to us? When God's on our side, when we've got the ruler of the heavens, the creator of the universe, the expanse of space, when we've got him with us, what can man do to us? And so the psalmist says, knowing God is on his side. He can live without fear of man. What can man do to me? And that's Jesus. I'll keep reminding you before he goes to the cross. Debbie and I sometimes have been just stopping to watch a movie. And, and she'll go on to the program, try to figure out, determine what movie to watch based on the title. That's really challenging. And the little tiny, tiny descriptions that might be found there. She found a movie called A Hidden Life that we watched the other night. A Hidden Life. And it's the story of a man named Franz Jägerstädter. Franz lived in Austria. And he was an Austrian farmer up in the mountains of Austria. Beautiful. Think of the sound of music, okay, if you want to think of the pictures that, where he was. And, and Franz had a commitment to Christ that caused him to question Hitler to the point that though he had already been trained as a soldier, he finally gets called up to go to war on behalf of Germany and he says, I can't do it. He goes in with the others who are called up and he stands in line and he will not take the oath to Adolf Hitler. You see, at the time of World War II, it wasn't just Jews who lost their lives, but there were Christians who died because they would not give in to Adolf Hitler, to Nazi Germany, who even protected Jews along the journey. Well, I could talk more about that, but I think it would, might, might be good for you to try to watch and see a little, the, it's the actually, uh, what's it called, the preview clip of a hidden life.
you were able to catch some of the lines that were in there, some pretty profound things. Franz's wife, Fanny, actually really believed that God was going to rescue her husband. In fact, before he even went off to say that he wouldn't fight, that he wouldn't honor Nazi Germany, before he even did that, they had met together and said, I, I, and she said, I, I really believe that Jesus is going to take care of you, that, that Jesus is going to bless us. And, and, and she believed that somehow he would come back home. However, you, the one scene that you saw there was just days before they beheaded Franz. He never came home. In fact, I've learned recently that, um, in, that the Jägerstaters have actually been persecuted right up until 1990. There were people who thought they were traitors. And as a group, they were simply the, his family and then probably others who started to follow that belief that you've got to honor God first, that, that they too were persecuted even up until 1990. But did you hear it? Did you hear Fanny's statement? And she's whispering, and she's whispering this to her husband just before he's taken off, and then the next day will actually be headed, be beheaded. She says, whatever you do, whatever comes, I am with you always. Now, she wanted her husband to know, I'm supporting you. Because she was pretty angry when he left, knowing that he was going to take this terrible step that would probably mean his life. And she didn't want him to, but yet she wanted to honor God. And so she wanted him to know whatever he did, whatever comes, because he was actually offered a letter that he could sign that would have gotten him off, would have set him free. All he had to say was, I will honor Hitler. That's all he had to do, just a few words. Sign a piece of paper. She wanted him to know, I'm there. But I think the message is so much more profound than that. Not just that her love was with him, but that God was with him. Aren't those the words that God tells us? I'm with you always to the end. I'm with you always. It comes out here in this psalm. In fact, the verses go on. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. He brought me into a place where I was free again. I'm thinking of, Han, of Franz, and, and he's no longer in this tiny little prison cell where he's getting beat up regularly and tortured and abused. But, but he's going to be set free into a spacious place. Isn't that what heaven is? <laughs> a spacious place. A, a place that, that's a mansion that's prepared for us. A, a beautiful, incredible place. He says, the Lord is with me. The psalmist says, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He's my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And the psalmist is trying to let us all know, regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of COVID-19 or people that might uh, attack you, or, or for Franz's case, regardless of these guards that were so abusive to him, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And we don't need to be afraid. It's Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah. And the psalmist will continue from that thought and say, and, and, and open up this incredible thought for us that there's power in the name of the Lord. And may I remind you that it was Jesus himself that talking to the disciples said, you haven't done this before, but from now on out, 
pray in my name and you can ask whatever you want, whatever you need, and I'll be there and I'll respond to you. It's in the name of the Lord. And so the psalmist says, all the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees. And you think that might be how Jesus felt as they're standing there beating him and attacking him. They put the blindfold on him. Tell us, prophesy, who is it that just struck you? And these bees are swarming around him, trying to harm him. But they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall. But the Lord helped. Can you hear Jesus singing those words on the way to Gethsemane? Knowing what's about to happen to him? Look, could these words have ministered to him even as he's being beaten and the flesh is being torn from his body and he's being nailed to that cross? I was about to fall. But the Lord There's power, there's resources that we probably are only barely making use of in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118 verse 14 says, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord is my strength and my song. Folks, there is a challenge to us here to be joyful. There's a challenge to us here to sing praise, to, to not be so gloomy and, and doomsayers and sad and discouraged, but to be joyful and to rejoice in God. This is the quote of the Psalm of Miriam that she sings as the children of Israel have come out of, of, of the Exodus. In fact, verse 15, verse 2, it says that he's singing, the Lord is my strength and my song. The Lord is our strength. When we need him most, when we're unsatisfied, the Lord is our strength. He's our song. He, he, and he ought to bring joy out of us, right? If we're thinking about the Lord, shouldn't there be some sense of us having joy because God, the Savior, who died on the cross and rose from the dead, and his spirit is with us? Amen. The Lord is our salvation. Is he? Did, did we just have our name on a baptismal certificate that one day we said, yeah, I, I committed my life to Jesus? Is he our salvation? Amen. Meaning he's the one we can trust above all others. He's the one who gives us hope. He's the one who forgives us and cleanses us from our sins because we all sin every single day. Amen. Even the intentional ones that we do against him, he delivers us. In fact, that word there for salvation means he's our rest and our rescue. He's a rest from our guilt. He's our rest from our discouragement. He's our rest from our own sinful ways, and he rescues us from our sin. God, our strength, our song. Plummer in a message that Spurgeon quoted said, good songs, good promises, good proverbs, good doctrines, are none the worse for, for age. What was sung just after the passage of the Red Sea is here sung by the prophet and shall be sung to the end of the world by the saints of the Most High. 
Even if you have, are a monotone, I challenge you to sing for joy for the Lord. And let me ask you a question. Because this is maybe why we would want to sing. Are you thankful? Are you thankful? Not just occasional. I, I find it interesting. You think about this. How many times do we begin our prayers with thanksgiving, but they only last for a couple of sentences, and then we quickly move on to something we want to ask God for? We were back, and I apologize. I'm going to give you an illustration from Theo, our grandson. Okay, now I'll try not to do a grandchild story every week, but this one just really fits, okay? Are you thankful? Theo started opening up his presents for his birthday. And he, and he gets them open, and you know what he did when he, was, when he got them open? He set them out, and he starts going around the room and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm like, no one told him to do that. The lady made a cake for him, and he goes looking for her that evening, and he goes up to her and says, thank you for the wonderful cake you made. I'm like, what is this kid? <laughs> All kinds of thanksgiving. We have him on tape, and this goes on for several minutes. He keeps coming back up to somebody else, and, and, and Papa, thank you for that, and, and Uncle Tim, thank you, and, and Grammy, thank you, and, and Mommy, and, and Grammy, thank you for wrapping the presents, and, and Mommy, thank you for, the, and Daddy, thank you, I never got a present like this, and, and he's going on like the Thanksgiving. He's not even playing with the toys or anything like that. He's simply saying, thank you, thank you. The psalmist says, the Lord has chastened me severely but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. You want to enter the holy of holy of places? Well, it helps to come humbly. It helps to know that you're a sinner. You don't deserve to be there. You don't have any right to enter that, that kingly place, that holy of holy places. You have no rights. You don't deserve it. But if you want to go in there, I suggest you begin with being a little bit thankful. And don't stop after just a couple of sentences. Maybe it's time for us to start listing. We ought to go back home today. We ought to write a page or two. And I'm tempted to say even more of, of the things that God has done for you that you should be saying because you just realize how special it is, how much it means to you. Because it's the way to enter, it says, to get into the gate. Is to go, you go through it with thanksgiving. <laughs> I've said this more than once. I've been in a group and I've said, we're going to start with giving thanks. And let's not rush off. And I'll, t I'll tell you, <laughs> more than not, Someone will say, God, thank you, and please bless us. Is it please bless us a request? <laughs> if, if you went from, God, thank you for this day, and please bless us, didn't you stop giving thanks and start asking for something? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. See, Jesus... Jesus is preparing to go to the cross. He's getting ready to return to heaven. And why is he repeating this psalm? Because for him, he needs to thank his father. Even as he's hanging there on the cross, he's giving God thanks. Jesus, Jesus understands the power and value of thanksgiving. But look at us. We have reason for thanksgiving that the psalmist says. Verse 21, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Maybe I'll just start listening all the prayers that God has answered for you. Just think back on the last day 
if your memory is not good like mine. Okay? Just go to this morning. How many things have you prayed this morning and God already answered? <laughs> Maybe he answered before he even asked. Before, before he even talked to him. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Jesus even said it himself. And, and the, the people, the religious guys, were just a little bit upset about this one, right? He's just told them the parable of the steward, and they realize, oh, he's talking about us. And he says, uh, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone that you've rejected. You see, they rejected his origin. They didn't believe he was from a kingly town, where, and he wasn't really from Nazareth, was he? He was from Bethlehem town of David. They didn't approve of his lack of formal education. Who is this guy? Even his own townspeople in Nazareth, you know, this is Jesus. Come on, we saw him as a carpenter. We know he's Joseph's sons. We, we know his brothers. We know his sisters. We know his mama. And so, who is this? They didn't approve of his disregard for religious traditions. He actually used the, the Sabbath to bless people. Oh my, what a novel thing. You weren't supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. And he says, no, I, 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 will, I will even heal because it's the right thing to do. And they didn't approve of his choice of friends. He spent time with tax collectors, sinners, fishermen, adulteresses, women of ill repute, and on and on and on. Why? Because he came to love all people. And Jesus said, I am cornerstone. Verse 24 says, the Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. With that little song we used to sing, it's now probably 50, 60 years old. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Verse 25, the Lord saves us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us with bows in hand. Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. This is the day. What day is that? That day, remember when, when these psalms were actually sung? Hosanna, when did we sing that? With Palm Sunday, the children of Israel coming down into Jerusalem. This is the day Daniel prophesied would come. You remember when we went through the book of Daniel, verse 25 of chapter 9? Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Seven years, it's in the 49 years, right? That's one set of sevens. There's, then there's 62 sevens, that's 434 more years. That totals up to 69 sevens or 483 years. And then there will be a final seven, which is, leads us to the end of time. Do you remember? I'm going to quote, it was 49 years or seven years between the time that Artaxerxes ordered for Jerusalem to be rebuilt and the rebuilding of the walls. From the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, it was another 434 years or 62 sevens until Christ died on the cross. What does the psalmist say? Then the anointed one, the Messiah. Oh, yes. Let me quote again from my notes from Daniel 9. The Messiah is cut off after the 483 lunar years, which is 173,880 days, from March 5, 
444 BC. That's the date that they were, they were starting to rebuild the walls. They know it. They've got evidence of the date, okay? To March 30th, AD 33, on the Gregorian Julian calendar, that's 173,880 days, and then the Messiah will be killed, Daniel 9:26. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. To the day, Jesus comes into Jerusalem and then is killed on a cross. It's prophesied in Daniel <laughs> 490 years earlier. And this is the same day. Matthew describes it. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. What does Hosanna mean? Save now. Save us. Today, for us, it means praise the Lord. But in its original meaning, it's save us. These people, the pilgrims, they're going down into Jerusalem. Jesus is riding on a donkey, and what are they singing? Jesus, save us. And what will he do by at the end of that week? Hang on a cross to save us. And the psalmist concludes then our psalm this morning with these simple words, the way he began. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. If there's nothing else you get from this message today, give more thanks. Amen. Give thanks for Jesus. Jesus who died on a cross for you so that you didn't have to be judged for your sin. Give thanks for God's word that's trustworthy and true. God keeps his promises. God does what he says he will do. God's word is alive and anointed and empowered with life and the very breath of God. Give thanks for his word. Give thanks that God is with you. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're thinking, no matter what you're doing, God's there with you. Give thanks that you're not by yourself. Give thanks that you don't need to be afraid of the virus. You don't need to be afraid of people. Man can't hurt you. Even if, like France, they take your life, they cannot take your salvation away from you. Amen. Give thanks. Give more thanks. And when you thought you're done, tap yourself on the shoulder and say, Oh no, you just begun. Give thanks. Oh God. I don't know if I can express my appreciation for to you for what you've done for me and for us. It, it feels frankly so inadequate. to say thank you for hanging on that cross and, and not just being physically abused, but being separated from heaven and, and becoming sin. We don't even totally get that one, God. You actually became sin for us so that we could have our sins forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for saying, forgive us while you hung on that cross. Thank you for saying that we could be with you in paradise someday. Thank you 
that we don't need to be afraid of people, whatever they may do or say, because you are with us. Thank you, God, that even this terrible virus that has taken thousands of lives around the globe, thank you that we don't need to fear it because you are with us. Thank you, God, for so much that you have blessed us with. Oh, Lord, thank you. And instead of saying amen, I challenge you to continue to give God thanks. Thank him more. The name of Jesus has power.